Hello everybody and welcome back to another Civi 398 assignment tutorial. So in this assignment tutorial we're going to be covering assignment number 8, question number 2. And this one's going to be arguably the hardest question of assignment number 8, but as you guys will see it's not too bad. It covers a lot of what we did in assignment number 7, so that's why I say it's probably the hardest. But you guys did really nice code in assignment 7, so you guys will see that you can actually use that code for this question and this question will be a piece of cake after you guys have developed that code. Now, if we look at question number two, it says the shown beams below have a length L, Young's modulus E, moments of inertia I, and are subjected to a constant distributed load Q. So I don't have the pictures of the beams, but they're the same beams from assignment number seven. And in essence, the first beam is simply supported, while the second beam has those fixed ends. Now, the question wants us to do three things. Part A says the total strain energy, or wants us to determine the total strain energy of the simply supported beam, so that's uh, part A beam. Uh, part B says the total strain energy of the fixed ends beam. And then finally, part C says the ratio of the total strain energy of the simply supported beam to the fixed ends beam. So if we look at this, it's basically just two questions, part A and part B, because part C, we're just taking our answer from part A and we're dividing it by our answer from part B, and that'll give us part C. So the major thing here is going to be, OK, how do I get part A and how do I get part B? Now, if we look at them, both questions are identical in the, in the sense that they both want the total strain energy of a beam. So the process for part A and part B is going to be the exact same but the only difference will be boundary conditions as we're going to see. So let's talk about how we find the total strain energy in a beam. Let's start off with the definition of total strain energy. So before we dealt with strain energy density, that's that U with the bar on top. But now we're talking about total strain energy. What is that? Well, that's the integral of the strain energy density over the volume of an object, or in our case, the volume of the beam. So all we can do is we can simplify this because no one likes integrating over a volume into a triple integral. So if we look at the very left hand side, our first integral is from zero to B. That's basically going in the X3 direction or the in plane depth of the beam or integrating over that. Our second integral in the middle there is we're integrating from negative H over two to H over two. So in this case, we're integrating over the height of the beam in that X2 direction. And finally, our integral closest to the U, we go from zero to L. So in that case, we're integrating over the length of the beam or in that x1 direction. So as we can see here, we're basically integrating over the volume of the beam. So if we look at this, all our parameters, b, h, and l, while we, we're kind of assuming all those because it's all parametric, so those are fine. The only thing that we're going to have a problem with is going to be that strain energy density, u, the function in which we need to integrate. However, we have a nice equation for that strain energy density, u because we have a linear elastic isotropic material. So that's the key here, a linear elastic isotropic material. However, as we talked about before in assignment number seven, for Euler-Bernoulli beams, we know that sigma 2, 2 is equal to sigma 1, 3, equal to sigma 2, 3, which is equal to sigma 3, 3, which is all equal to zero. And this is great because we can look at our equation above here, which we need to solve for, and we could say four of those terms go to zero. We don't care about them, they disappear. So in the end, our equation that we need to solve for becomes simply this, where our strain energy density is 1 half multiplied by sigma 1, 1 times epsilon 1, 1 plus sigma 1, 2 times gamma 1, 2. And as we're going to see, there's going to be more simplification later. But for this point right now, we're pretty happy because we only need four components to solve for this function. And once we have this function, all we need to do is integrate it three times. But of course, you guys will be using Mathematica, so the integration will be nice and easy hardest part will be getting this strain energy density. So if we look at the components that we need, here's in essence what it is. We need two stress components and two strain components. So let's talk about how we find the stress components of a beam first. So in this case, we need sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2. And this is why I keep going back to assignment number seven, because if you guys remember, we actually solved for the stress components, sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2 in assignment number seven. So this should just be more of a review for you guys. So as we saw in assignment seven, the key, first key that we're going to have to use to solve these is solving that deflection equation. How do we do this in assignment seven? Well, we knew that EI multiplied by the fourth derivative of that deflection function was equal to Q. Now, in this case, we know EI and we know Q. We just need to solve for our deflection function Y. So that's not going to be too hard. 
And then with that deflection function, we can calculate the shear and the bending moment functions, where the shear function is EI multiplied by the third derivative of the deflection function, and our moment function is EI multiplied by the second derivative of that deflection function. So as we can see here, this is why the deflection function is so key, because it allows us to solve for a shear and our moment functions. Because if we take it a step further and we want to solve for these stress components, they're going to be a function of those shear and moment equations or functions. So if we look at stress component sigma 1, 1 first, we know that it can be found by simply going negative 1 multiplied by m. So m is that moment function that we just talked about multiplied by x2, where x2 is simply x2. We don't need to change anything and then divided by the moment of inertia i. So the only thing we don't know in this equation is our moment function. However, we solved for it on the previous slide. Sigma 1, 1, no problem at all. How about sigma 1, 2, so the shear component? It's a little bit more tricky in that sigma 1, 2 is equal to negative 1 multiplied by v, where v is that shear function, multiplied by q. And we're going to talk about what q is in a second, and then we divide everything by i and b. Looking at this from a step back, the only two things that we don't know right off the bat is going to be v as well as q. However, v, our shear function, we solved for in the previous slide, so that's not a problem. The only thing we don't know is q. However, if we define our x1 axis as running through the centroid of this beam, which is what we always do, q has a nice formula where it's simply going to be a function of h, b, and x2. And in this case, we know all of them. h is whatever, b is whatever, and x2 is just x2. Nothing changes about that. So from here, we can conclude that we know our two stress components, sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2. So again, if you guys did assignment 7 correctly, you guys already have the code to find these two, which is great because all you guys are going to have to do, use that code, you have your two stress components. However, one thing we didn't talk about in assignment number 7 was the strain components of the beams. So we found out sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2, but we didn't find epsilon 1, 1 or epsilon 1, 2. However, as you guys are going to see, it's going to be pretty easy. So if we ignore Poisson's ratio and assume small deformations, the displacement function can be expressed as u is equal to u1, u2, u3, where u1 is simply negative x2 multiplied by the first derivative of the deflection function, u2 is simply y, our deflection function, and u3 is going to be 0. Now this is great because if we have that displacement function, we know that we can solve for the displacement gradient, nabla u. And then furthermore, we can take that nabla u, that displacement gradient, and then solve for the small strain tensor, which is exactly what we want because that small strain tensor, that'll contain our information concerning epsilon 1, 1, as well as epsilon 1, 2. So if we say, all right, well, here's our displacement gradient, nothing too crazy. We find out that it's actually not too hard to solve for. And we can take it a step further by saying, all right, well, now that I know the displacement gradient, I can find that small strain tensor. And as you guys are going to see, this tensor has the information we need for epsilon 1, 1, as well as epsilon 1, 2. So if we look at epsilon 1, 1, we see that it's actually going to be negative x2 multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection function. And at this point, that's a piece of cake because x2 is just x2, and our deflection function we already know that we solve for that almost immediately at the beginning of this question. So that's going to be epsilon 1, 1. But if we look at epsilon 1, 2, it's actually equal to 0, as you guys will see. And this is great because that takes our strain energy density equation and simplifies it actually quite a bit more. So let's go back now that we know these components and look at our strain energy density equation. So if we substitute the values of stress and strain, so Originally, we have u is equal to 1 half sigma 1, 1, epsilon 1, 1, etc., etc. But if we substitute the values in, we get this equation here. And the nice thing is if we look at gamma 1, 2, we know that that's going to be equal to 0 because, of course, epsilon 1, 2 is equal to 0. So therefore, this equation actually simplifies quite nicely. And this right here will be the equation you guys can use for both of those beams. Now, if we look at this equation, we see that it's a function of i. Well, we're keeping I parametric, so that's not a problem. It's a function of x1. Again, not a problem. That's just going to be x1. It's also a function of x2. Again, not a problem. The things that are going to change between part A and part B are going to be that moment function as well as that deflection function. So if a lot of you guys say, hey, Clayton, I understand the process, but I don't really understand how a simply supported beam is going to be different than a fixed ends beam. Well, it makes sense because 
Of course, those beams are going to have different deflection profiles. And if they have different deflection profiles, they have different moment profiles. So we're going to use this equation here for both part A and part B. And depending on what boundary conditions you assume, both your moment function as well as your deflection function are going to change between the two. And then again, part C is just simply comparing part A and part B. So take your answer from part A, divide it by your answer in part B. You're going to be good to go. And that's it for this question. So hopefully this helps you guys. Again, I personally think that this is the absolute hardest question in this assignment. If you guys can get this, it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. So thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in question number three.